Matt. I'm glad you did that. Matthew chapter, would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? Matt, Matthew, Romans chapter 4. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a long night, folks. I can feel it already. Romans chapter 4, verse number 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be of grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, and before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. And according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered, not at the promise of God, through uh, unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. How many believe Jesus was raised from the dead? Amen. And then he said, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Father, build our faith tonight. Lord, we have got to have a strong faith. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what next week, next month, next year. But I know who holds all those days and weeks and months and years in his hand, and that is you. And so all I have to do is hold to that unseen hand and I must have the faith to do that every single day. And so, Lord, as we see what's going on in our world, we must have the ability to trust you with all our heart and not lean to our own understanding. And so give us, Lord, the tools tonight so that we might strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. I started this morning preaching on how to strengthen your faith. And we talked about the, um, the unjust judge and the widow lady. And, of course, you know the story how because of her uh, coming to him continually, uh, the Bible says he, she troubled him so much and she was so persistent in that that uh, he eventually gave her what she was asking for. Now, I remind you tonight, I don't know that that is clearly just about being persistent because the point is it was an unjust judge. Uh, we have a just judge tonight. I don't know that we always have. I believe God is ready to answer our prayers and wants to answer our prayers, but sometimes we must continue in prayer. But in Luke 18, 80 says this, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And that's the issue tonight. We're thinking about the coming of the Lord. and is he, Jesus is coming soon. Boy, one of the things that Jesus, when he comes, what he wants to find is he wants to find faith. A faith like that woman that was committed, that faith that just didn't quit and didn't give up. And that's the kind of faith I believe Jesus is wanting to find. I was reading a book uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was a book written in the late 60s, early 70s. And in that book, the writer of that book, which, by the way, is not a, a Baptist um, Bible, but not a Baptist, but it was interesting to me because what he wrote, he said, these are the most difficult times that we've ever seen in, 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 in time, in history. And I thought, oh my goodness, if he'd be right now. I mean, back in the 60s and 70s, you didn't have computers. You didn't have cell phones. You didn't have iPods and iPads. You didn't have iWatches. I mean... We, we are living today, I think, in some of the most difficult days that a Christian could ever live. And I, I, I mean that. We do. I mean, there's always been sin, and it has always been rampant. And sometimes they say, well, man, I remember the good old days. The good old days were bad, too. All the days are bad. But they've gotten worse. And the problem is, is that we live 
in a day where sin is so accessible, like it has never, ever been before. I walk in the auditorium, two boys over there from the bus route have their cell phones out and earphones in and listening to the earphone. Now, I don't know, I don't know, did they take them out while I was, I was preaching? Did they, did they do it on their own without somebody telling them? Good, well, good for them. But they were, that's what I'm talking about. These kids have these phones and these iPads and, and the sensuality of today, the, the, the immorality today, the wicked, ungodly relationships that we're seeing today everywhere. And i got to tell you, we are living in a day where it is harder than ever to keep a committed faith. It is. Uh, uh, the Bible says that iniquity shall, uh, iniquity shall abound and the love of, of many shall wax cold. That's now. And I believe that. I believe it is harder to keep people faithful today than it has ever been because they're being bombarded from every single avenue that can be and, and people's faith. There's, there's so many different things crying for people's time. And unfortunately, typically God takes the back burner of life. And people are not putting, putting Him first. And He doesn't have the preeminence. Now, praise the Lord, that doesn't mean we cannot have the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for. And he is pointing to Abraham here. He has told us something I think is absolutely wonderful, that it wasn't just something that was for him. It says it was for us too. So we can have the same faith as Abraham, amen? And he's the father of faith. He's the one that every Jew looks to. And he, is, he was a great, great man of faith. But we can have that same faith tonight in our own life. And so we began looking at these verses, amazing verses, and we have been looking at them and trying to find what is it that we can do to strengthen our faith. As, as, as it said of Abraham, his faith was not weak, but he had a strong faith. And even though he was 100 years old and he was dead and his wife was 99 years old and he was dead, he still believed. He did not stagger at the promise of God. He believed that God could still give him a son and God could give him life and his wife Sarah life and they could still have a baby and praise the Lord, they did exactly that. And thank God for that kind of faith, amen? By the way, just so you know, after Sarah died, Abraham married again and guess what? He had more kids. So God not only made him alive, but God kept him alive. Amen? So we can see some amazing things here. And the first thing that we learned this morning about this thing of strengthening your faith is, number one, we have to understand that faith releases the grace of God. And he said it right there. He talked about in Romans 4, 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be of grace to the end, the promise might be sure. So, faith opens the door to grace. Amen? How'd you get saved? You got saved by grace through faith. Amen? And it opens up, faith opens up grace so you can get saved. That beautiful, wonderful, uh, unmerited favor. And then after you're saved, faith continues to open up grace wherein we can stand. We have access to the throne of what? Grace. And we can come to God and ask for grace to help in our times of need. Man, what a wonderful thing it is to be a Christian. And then we learn, secondly, not only that, that faith releases the grace of God, but faith relies on the promises of God. And that's what he said there in verse number 16. He said in verse number 16, he said there to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Aren't you glad that the promises of God are there so we can be sure, number one, about our salvation. But we can be sure about anything that God promises. Hey, the promises of God are yea and amen. That's what the Bible says. And so we have the promise. I thought about that song. Standing on the promises, it says that cannot fail. It cannot fail. And then he said, standing on the promises that I shall not fall. So, boy, if you're standing on the promises, you're standing on pretty good ground. Amen? And so what's the, what's the answer to that? we got to know the promises of God. 
We've got to be learning and understanding and knowing the promises of God. Why? Because if we ask anything according to His will, which would be the promises of God, my friend, we know that He hears those petitions because those are the petitions He wants. And so faith is getting from God what He wants you to get. And so the promises of God, what a wonderful thing that we know that God is promising, that we can claim those promises and see God answer prayer. Aren't you glad for that tonight? So let's get into the next two points and finish this thing out by 9 o'clock tonight. Amen? You never know sometimes, right? But number three, this is great, and this is my favorite point right here. Faith realizes the greatness of God. Faith realizes the greatness of God. Look at verse number 17. This is good. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Then look what he says next. Before him, that's God, whom he believed, he is Abraham, Believe, that's God. Even God, who what? Quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Boy, that's such an amazing statement. Pastor, explain it to me. I can't. You see, th- he, he can call things that aren't there, and, but they are. See, God doesn't deal with time. God sees everything that has ever happened and that will happen all at the same time. You know that? Just like a parade up in a, up in a blimp up there and you look down, you can see the beginning of the parade, you can see the end of the parade, you can see the middle of the parade, you can see the whole thing at the same time. God sees everything. Amen? So I can't explain them, but I trust them. But here's what he said. He is saying there that he believed even God who quickeneth the dead, and call it those things which be not as though they were. Now, don't miss this point. So we said in the last point, gray, or rather faith, relies on the promises of God. But you got to take it a step further. It not only relies on the promises of God, but it also looks to the one who made the promise. You have to look at the one that made the promise. Um, You cannot rely on a promise if you don't know the one who is making the promise. And you don't know the character of that person who's making the promise. Would you agree with that? You need to know the character. You have to look beyond the promise to the one who is making that promise. How many of of you have ever had someone promise you something? Now, let, let, let me finish it out. Don't go jump ahead of me here. That promised you something, and it was a great promise, and you wanted it to happen, but you... You doubted very seriously that he would fulfill the promise. Uh, my wife with a Corvette? Okay. What does that mean? You never did. Isn't that terrible, folks? Pray for Brother Listen. He's still bitter about that. You can tell because the first thing you thought about was that. Amen. That's what they say, right? When you talk about and the first thing that comes to your mind, you're still bitter. But, but we've all, how many have had that happen? Raise your hand. Absolutely. Because, and, and, and by the way, you want the promise to be fulfilled. But the problem is you doubt it because you, you know the character, the person who made the promise. And so when it, here's the application. Not only is it important to, un, to know the promises of God, you've got to look at the one who's behind the promise. You've got to look at the character of God who made the promise. Because not only knowing the promise will certainly strengthen your faith, boy, you better make sure you are learning about the character of God because He's made the promise. If you know His character, you know He is going to fulfill that promise. Man, there are people that have been scammed by people, be it through an email, through a text, uh, through a phone call. By pe- I remember several years ago, I had an email from this guy in Africa. Uh, and, and I think it was Ghana. And boy, it was a great, man, I'd never gotten one before. And it said, you know, I've got millions of, I've got $40 million, and all I need is somebody who would allow me to put that many money in their account. And, uh, and, and man, I just got to get it to somebody. And gullible me. Now, I didn't do it, but the first thought was, wow, that sounds like a good deal to me. Now, as I looked into it, and I found out it was a, it was a scam. 
But you, do you know? I, I studied that thing. I was being so. Do you realize there are people that actually believed it? And they're all kind of scared. people calling up people and telling them, "Boy, if you if you if you send us this check, we'll send you this." Here's the problem: people, people are making promises to them, and they don't even know them. They don't know their character. You know what that is? That's dumb. To, to believe somebody who's promising something, but you don't even know them, you don't even know their character. And that's what Abraham based his faith on. He didn't just base it on the promise. He based it on the person who was making the promise, the God that was making that promise. I think of Psalms 9, verse number 10. Look, look at Psalms 9, verse number 10. This is a great verse. Psalms 9, 10. It says, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Notice he says, they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. See, you've got to know, one of the wonderful things about knowing the names of God that is important for your faith is because in the Bible, the names of God reflect the character of God. And that's why they said, because you know the names of God, that you can put your trust in God. Oh, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 10, I, did, I shared this with the men a few weeks ago. The name of the Lord is a, look at Psalms 18 and verse number 10. This is a great verse. Look at this. Proverbs 18, verse number 10. The name of the Lord is a what? It's a strong tower. And then he says this, the righteous runneth into it and is safe. So he says the name of the Lord. What, what's he talking about there? The name of the Lord once again tells us the character of God. So when we run to the Lord and we run to a certain aspect of his name, then we know we can trust him because of that name, because that name reflects his character. For example, when Abraham went up to Mount Moriah with his son Isaac, and he got up there, and of course they brought the wood and uh, brought the fire and got up there. And Isaac said, Father, behold the wood, behold the fire. Where is the sacrifice? And what did he say? The Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. And he, he still went, he still obeyed God because that's what faith does. Faith works, amen? It doesn't just work, it works. And so... He went through the motions, and he put Isaac on there, and Isaac yielded. And I think Isaac had just about as much faith as his daddy did. And he got on top of that thing, and he got the knife. He was ready to go all the way through it in faith. And when that knife was just about to come down, you know the story. God stopped him. And, of course, over in the weeds over there was a ram that had its antlers in the, in, the weed, in the bushes there. And he then took that ram and he sacrificed that ram. God provided the sacrifice. And after it was all done, you know what? He built an altar there. And you know what he called that altar? He called it Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. See, the reason why he went through it all, he believed God would provide. I think he believed even if he killed Isaac, God would still provide. God would raise Isaac up. Amen? But to see, he trusted God. He strengthened his faith because he knew the character of God. He knew the name of God. I think about Moses when he battled against the Amalekites. And, and as he stood there, and Aaron and her, 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 they lifted up his arms. And as he lifted up his arms, Israel fought and the victory came. And during that time, he called God by this name. He called him Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, my banner or flag of victory. And so if you are going to be able to strengthen your faith, not only do you need to be learning the promises of God, studying the promises of God, gleaning the promises of God, boy, you better make sure that you are learning about the character of God and knowing the kind of God that you have. Now, if your faith is weak tonight, then here's what I would suggest. Get to know God. If you're struggling in your faith, you need to get to know God. You say, Pastor, how do I get to know God? Through the Word of God. 
And the more you get into your Bible, the more you get to know the greatness of God. I like what David said in Psalms 143.8. He said, cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Jews, many Jews would start the day off by singing a psalm. And David said, cause me to hear thy loving kindness. What he was talking about, Lord, cause me to get up tomorrow morning and sing a song about your loving kindness. I want to remember your loving kindness tomorrow morning. And then he says in another place, in thy faithfulness at night. See, you've got to be reminding yourself. Nobody else will probably remind you. But you've got to remind yourself all the time of the character of God. So you can trust him. And the, more, and the better you know God and the better you know his character, my friend, the more you are going to strengthen your faith. That's the only way to know about the greatness of God is getting the word. That's the only way you're going to know about the promises of God is to get into his word. That's the only way you're going to know the will of God is to get into his word. Now notice what Abraham saw God being. Look at verse 17. He said, before him who believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So you see, Abraham probably was saying something like this. He was saying, God, you're the, you're the resurrection. You give the life. I don't have any life in me anymore. Sarah has no life in her anymore. And you're able to create things out of nothing and do something with nothing. He said, if this thing is going to happen, he says, you're going to have to do it. But it was based on the fact that he believed God was the one that quickeneth the dead. If you and I are going to have a strong faith, we're going to have to see and know the character of God, the greatness of God, and by doing that, that strengthens our faith. All my friends, that's one of the greatest reasons for Bible reading. That's one of the greatest reasons to read your Bible. Because what you're going to do every time you read your Bible, every day I think you read your Bible, you're going to learn something about the greatness of God. If you're looking for it, and I'm always looking for that, underlinings, boy, that tells me about the greatness of God in this area. If you're going get, to get the faith that you need to have, you need to be reading your Bible, studying the Bible, listen to Bible teaching, listen to Bible preaching, getting to know God behind the promises, behind those promises. That's why I believe Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of of God. How else are you going to get the full picture of God if you don't read the whole Bible? How are you going to get the whole picture? And see, you know, I've read lots of biographies, but I've never just read a part of a biography because I want to know the whole man. And if you're going to know somebody, you want to read everything about them in that book. My friend, I read my Bible through several times during the year. I don't do it just to be able to say that. That, that, that doesn't that's not important to me. What's important to me, I want to read my Bible through as many times as I can in the year. You know what? I just want to get to know who God is. I just want to know Him. And every year I learn more things about Him and more promises that He's given. There are 13,000 promises in the Bible. How many do you know? Somebody say amen. There are 13,000. Boy, we ought to get to know those promises, amen? Yeah, and that's the, key to the, that's the key to the bank. Amen? Hey, that's your ATM card. God don't give no credit cards, amen? You just take directly from the bank. And, I, and, that's, why, and that's why, again, I know I beat this thing like a dead horse, but it, it, it needs to be beat. That's why you, better, you ought to get up tomorrow morning and read your Bible. And, I'm, and by the way, man, there are, there, are, uh, there are great books to read, devotionals. I, am, I read two devotionals every day, but I'm going to tell you, no devotional is ever going to replace my Bible. i got to read the Bible. I, I don't want just somebody, my, you know, when we were kids, uh, we would find bubble gum on the ground or under something. And when you're kids, you don't know any better. And you know what? It actually tastes better after it's been sitting for a while. Well, I know it is disgusting, but it's true. How many have ever eaten somebody else, gum that's been chewed? Anybody? Am I, there you go. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. Some, 
some of you are, I don't care about parasites right now. <laughs> I didn't care about when I was a kid. But, but I take the, we chew that bubble gum. And it was fine. And I'm alive. You ought to look up sometime, how is it that those of us that are over 40 ever lived? You ever seen that? We, we rode our bikes without our helmets. We drank water from a hose. We didn't wear seat belts. How in the world are we alive today? Amen? But, li- but listen to me. The truth is, I'd rather chew my own bubble gum than chewing somebody else's. Amen? I got bubble gum in there. I'll give everybody a piece of bubble gum tonight. But you, I, I, as a, if I was a kid, I wouldn't do it. There's no way I'd do it now. I'd say, give me my own bubble gum. Amen? And I'm saying the same thing. Why is it that some Christians will, will feel, uh, feel, what is it, streams of, what's a devotional? They're, yeah, that book right there. And, and I'm not against it. I've read it. I've used every devotional. Spurgeon's, morning, morning, evening, evening. I read them both. I read them all. I love them. They give me thoughts. But I'm going to tell you something. Why is, why, we cannot live on other people's chewed food. Can't do it, man. You've got, to, you've got to chew your own food. Oh, who likes chewing your own food? Everybody, amen. And that's what I'm trying to say this morning. Go ahead, get your devotional, read it, love it, use it, it'll help you. But nothing will help you like the good old-fashioned B-I-B-L-E. Read the Bible, friend. Read your Bible. Why? Because you'll learn the promises of God. You will learn about the greatness of God. He will reveal himself to you in so many wonderful ways. My goodness. We've got to get back to reading the book. Just get in your Bible and that will solve so many of your problems. Oh, my. Abraham had two options now. He had two options. in this. Either he was going to look at himself and look at Sarah. And by the way, they already did that. And how'd that work out? Or the other option was to look to God. And that worked out pretty good. Uh, can I tell you something? You cannot look to yourself and you cannot look to people because, my friend, when you look to yourself and you look to people, it is, it is going to discourage you and it is going to weaken your faith. The only way that you are going to strengthen your faith, is you've got to get your eyes off of people. Get them off of people. Get them off of the preacher. Get them off of the Sundays. Get them off of us. You need to get your eyes on Jesus Christ. Look at him. Oh my goodness. David wrote in Psalms 146.3, put not your trust in princes. He's referring to himself. In royalty. And kings and princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. I know people help us, and we need each other. But when it comes to the real help we need in life, man cannot provide that. Only God can do that. You've got to get your eyes. Spurgeon said, look at yourself and doubts will increase. Look at Jesus and they will disappear. And I know, I've been there many, many times. I have gotten up some mornings and discouraged and and thinking I can't do this, I can't do that. And and, and then, then, uh, thank God I've got enough of a duty mind that as discouraged as I have been at times, I still got my Bible out and read it. And I didn't want to. But I'm such a rut Christian that I just do it anyways even though I don't want to. And I read it. And all of a sudden, my faith starts to kind of get on fire a little bit. And then, I, and then maybe my faith isn't as strong as it should be sometimes, but then I know I got to pray. And then I get into the prayer closet and I begin to pray and pour my heart out to God and talk to Him and, 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 and love on Him and praise Him and then ask Him for things and plead with Him and supplication. And, 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 and every single time, Every single time. But when I'm done, I come out, I feel like I'm Superman. I do. I don't have any other way to explain it. I go in and I'm, I'm, I'm dry and I'm dead. I, I beat down. And then I come out and I feel like, man, I, I'm, uh, remember that cartoon Underdog? You all remember that? 
and he had a little ring, and, and you opened it up, and he had that pill that he would take, and all of a sudden he turned into this superhero dog. I mean that. Brother man, I mean this. Well, that's how I feel. I went in thinking I can't do something. I come out thinking, we can do it, Lord. We can do this. And all of a sudden, ideas or answers or thoughts or wisdom or understanding comes into my mind. To me, it's absolutely amazing. And I don't understand why Christians don't want to get in the book. Because that's the only way your faith will ever get strengthened. You get up, you're discouraged, you just eat your Wheaties and go on with your day, and you stay discouraged all day. I don't want to stay discouraged. I get discouraged. Absolutely, everybody does. But I don't want to stay discouraged. And you have to strengthen your faith. And you can only strengthen it when you get in this book and you begin to see the promises of God, claim those promises, pray, stand on those promises, and then you get to see the, the one behind the promises, how great he is, what he's done. It's amazing. It's amazing to me. It's miracles. Miracles. Every day can be a miracle in your life if you want it to be. If you want it to be. There's no reason in the world. Why, we'll all get discouraged. No reason to stay discouraged or disheartened. Like the song, are we downhearted? No, no, no. Are we downhearted? No, no, no. Troubles may come and troubles may go. We trust in Jesus, come whim or woe. Are you downhearted? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, whistle. Oh, no, no. Amen. You say, you know that song pretty good. I sang it a lot of times. I sang it tons of times, man. Joe, are you downhearted? Yes, yes, yes. And don't look at me like a Pharisee. You've been there too. Learn the song, amen. Better yet, learn the promises of God. Learn the character of God. Find out what God is like. And let it sink in the very depths of your soul. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 12. You know the verse, but it's always good to look at it. Look what it says. Look what it says. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also compass about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And sin, and let's not forget that now in this whole teaching of faith, if there's sin in your life, then I, my friend, your faith will never get strengthened if you have sin in your life. You've got to get rid of that. And sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before. Notice the next two words. What does it say? Looking unto yourself? No, looking unto Jesus. Look at this, the author and finisher of our faith. So he is the beginning of our faith. And he is the end of our faith. And he's everything in between. Everything. Everything that's been in my life from the day I got saved to the day I get taken or, or I, we go together or I, God takes me myself. Man, everything in between there. He's the author and finisher of my faith and all that. But I got to look into him. I got to keep my eyes on him. Get, my, get your eyes off of people. They'll discourage you. Get your eyes on the Lord. Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. Tell that to the Mormons, by the way. Uh, Micah 7, 7, therefore I will look unto the Lord and I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Remember back in Genesis 18, Abraham's told that he's going to have a son. He laughs. I don't think in a disrespectful way, just like somebody says, this is going to happen. You think, <laughs> I just don't see how that's going to happen. That's basically what he said. <laughs> really? I just don't see how. Man, that's amazing. Really? And the angel comes back and says to him in, I, in Genesis 18, 14, well, you know, you know what he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? Amen? Hey, can I ask you that question? Answer that question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. No. Is that still good today, Pastor? Absolutely. Absolutely. He changes not, the Bible says. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Jeremiah answered that question in, in the middle of all the mess that he was involved in and preaching to people that wanted nothing to do with him. 
Man, at least when I preach, I look out at a congregation, they want what I got. But, and God even told them, he said, man, when you get up and preach, you look out there, not a one of them going to want what you got. He said, but don't get discouraged because of their faces, amen. Now, I'm, uh, nobody here discourages me, I just want you to know that. But here, here he's, he's, he is strengthening his own faith. He says, ah, Lord God, behold, look how he's doing it now. There's something to be learned here in your prayer life. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. Do you ever do that, Dad? You say, Dad, your, your son says, Dad, are you strong? Oh, I sure am. And I'd always do it. I'd push it up like this because I don't have muscles. <laughs> so I push it up. Oh, Daddy's strong. He said, a stretched out arm. He said, look at this arm, God says. Amen, Isaiah? Where's the beef? Right here, man. But what does he say? And there is nothing. He's saying this to God. He's saying, hey, there's nothing too hard for thee. He's saying that to God. Yeah, by the way, he's doing it. God already knew that. God did not need that from him. God's very comfortable in who he is. Amen? He needed it for himself. He was strengthened his faith. He said, God, you're the one that made the heaven and the earth. You're the one that has all the power. You've got the arm outstretched, ready to do something. Is there anything too hard for thee? That's a rhetorical question. He's saying to himself, no, nothing. You can do it. You can do it, Lord. You can do it. Oh, my. There is no promise in the Bible too hard for God to fulfill. There is no need in your life that God cannot meet in your life. A need. God can meet it. Look, look at Jeremiah 33, 3. I'm trying to teach you the principles here. Notice, again, you know, these principles I'm teaching you are the same principles that Old Testament prophets and New Testament Christians used. Look at Jeremiah 33, 1. What did I say? Relies upon the promises of God. That's how faith is strengthened. And it realizes the greatness of God. Notice here how God helps Jeremiah. Do that with that ver those two very same principles. Look it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time. He's in prison. While he was yet shut up in the court of the prison. By the way, wasn't any prisons like today. Saying, God's saying this now. Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord, Jehovah, is his name. Now look it. So what did he just do? He, he revealed his greatness to Jeremiah. He's in the prison. He reveals his greatness. He's helping Jeremiah see the greatness of God. Then look what he said. Now look at the next thing. Then he gives him a promise. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. He strengthened Jeremiah's faith. How? He said, I'm going to give you a promise, Jeremiah, and I'm going to back it up with my character. Amen? That's the way you're going to strengthen your faith. There is no other way. You read your Bible, looking for the prom underline the promises of God. Put a P by the promises of God. And you look, every time you read through that, you focus on that promise. And just for a minute, just kind of think about that promise. And then tell the Lord, Lord, you can do this. You can do this. I believe you. I trust you. That's what you do. God was helping him to strengthen his faith. God wants to help you. He loves you tonight. If you're struggling in faith, then you need to get it back the same way Abraham did and the same way Jeremiah did and the same way every Christian has ever done. Someone has said the only thing that lies outside the reach of prayer is that which lies outside the will of God. You know something is a promise. If you know something is a will of God, you pray for it till you get it. Amen? If you believe that God saves and that he is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance, then you pray like that verse is in the Bible. And believe that. With Brother Terry gave a wonderful devotion there in there about prayers. Pray without ceasing. What a wonderful verse. And I, I just put in my two cents at the end there, and I reminded him about George Mueller. George Mueller, for 50 years, prayed for two friends. George Mueller died without seeing the promise fulfilled. But at his funeral, one of those friends got saved. And then six months later, the other friend got saved. Uh, 
standing on the promises, I shall not fall and it shall not fail. Oh, man, I tell you, there's no problem that God cannot solve in your life. Somebody asked a preacher one day, preacher, do you have any problem? He said, only when I'm awake or asleep. Amen? How many can relate to that? What's that what, what was he saying? Yeah, I've got problems. Everybody's got them. You got them when you're awake and you got them when you're asleep. But God can take care of every problem. Someone else said, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know he could solve them. Praise the Lord. Uh, by the way, look at, look at Abraham's strong faith. Notice in Romans 4, go back, Romans 4, 21. Look at his strong faith. I, I like this. It says in Romans 4, 21, and being, notice those next two words, fully persuaded, completely persuaded, he realized the greatness of God, that what he, God, promised. Notice, he was able also to perform. Amen? God can do it. That's what he was saying. I'm totally persuaded, Lord. I know it. I know you. if you promise it, Lord, you can do that. And that's the way you ought to pray. And claim those promises. Now, let me say this. God may not solve your problem the way that you want it to be solved. I completely believe that when you pray, and you pray fervently, and pray righteously, that God will answer your prayer. He may answer it the way He wants to answer it. It may not always be done. Why? Because what does He say in Isaiah chapter 5, 55 and verse number 8? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen? So, we're learning how can we strengthen our faith because we want to have a strong faith like Abraham. We want to have a faith when God comes back and, and he sees that faith, he'll say, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. How are we going to do that? Well, we release the grace of God by faith. We strengthen our faith by relying upon the promises of God. And then we strengthen our faith by realizing the greatness of God. And then lastly, please notice this. This is just as important as anything else. Number four, faith reveals the glory of God. This is the cherry on top right here. As far as I'm concerned, you don't have a Sunday until you have a cherry on top. And you're, and you're not going to get the full strength of faith in your life if you don't do this. What do you got to do? Give God the glory. Give God the glory. God should be, God wants the glory for your life of faith. And He will get that. If you're living a life of faith, he, you don't have to say it. You don't have to get up and tell it. People will see it. People will know if you have a life of faith. Notice what He says in Romans 4.20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. Notice, giving Glory to God. So when our faith is strengthened and we live a strong faith, it gives glory to God. It gives Him glory. When we read the account about Abraham being here in these verses and back in Genesis 18 and further, when we read that, you know who gets the glory for that? Not Abraham. God does. And that increases our faith in being able to trust God even more. Wouldn't you like tonight to say, God, I want you to get the glory? Don't you want to give God praise? Don't you want to give God honor? Don't you want to bless God? How many here God blesses you? Amen. Let's bless the Lord. Let's bless Him. Let's make Him happy. Let's please Him. And you know the great, one of the greatest ways that you can please God and bless Him and honor Him and praise Him and give Him glory is when you believe Him. And you exercise your faith. And you say, God, I want more faith because I want to give you more glory. Amen? It, it's, somebody said this, and I know I'm not going to quote it right, but uh, it's no telling what God can do to, for somebody or use somebody who does not want the glory and is willing to give God the glory. They're not doing it for themselves, for how they're going to look, but they want God to get the glory. There's no telling what God could do. And someone who says, I want God to get the glory. I want God to get the praise. No greater way to glorify God than to just to believe it. Think about this. Let's say some people from the church, two, two or three people gotten from the church going down the, the Kens. Amen. 
Ken's, you know, you know Ken's, right? A cola. And, and you're sitting down and you got a Philadelphia cheesesteak sandwich. Somebody say amen to that. How many have ever had Ken's Philadelphia? How, how many would testify this, this evening? Praise the Lord. That's a wonderful sandwich right there. Oh, my. That's, that, if you haven't gotten it, your assignment this week is to go to Ken's and get a Philadelphia cheesesteak sandwich. You will be so happy if you do. And so they're sitting around. They're saying, you know, Pastor Grand, he's a he's, he's, he's such a nice man. He's, he's a good guy. And, you know, he, he's, he, he, he does this and this. But you know what? And I hate to say this, somebody says, but um, you can't believe him. Ouch. How many have ever known somebody that was nice, but in your mind you think, I can't believe him though when he says something. I can't believe him if he's going to make a promise. You all here? And uh, by the way, if you said that, everything else you said about me before that means nothing now. You just, you just killed my character. By the way, I'm saying if it was true. If it was true. But you can't believe me. Boy, that just, that would break my heart. It would break my heart. If somebody said, well, I don't believe Pastor Grant, I'd quit the ministry if that was true. Amen? Amen. All right. How about God? God has got, shows all these things in the Bible, and you can't believe them. You can't believe them. Wow. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Can I show you a verse? Look at, um, uh, can I remind you a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold? You know God, and God has righteous pride. But do you think that to God one of the most important things he has is his name? He has so many names, and they reveal his character. And if you cannot believe him, when it says that God will provide, but you can't believe that? You can't tithe? And believe that God's going to take care of you? C can I tell you what you've done? Look at, uh, did I tell you what we were looking? First John chapter 5, verse number 10. Now, can I say initially, this is talking about salvation, okay? I don't want to mislead you. But look what he says here. I believe the principle, though, is the same. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10. Notice, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Notice, he that believeth not God hath made him a what? A liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave to his Son. Could, could it be safe to say, if we don't believe the record that God has placed about God in the Bible... And you can't say, God, I believe you. And then not just say it, but even act in faith on that. Because faith is obedience. It's not a feeling. It is obedience. So if you cannot believe him, what are you making him? A liar. Do you think maybe that hurts him? Do you think maybe that breaks the heart of God? And see, that's why one of the greatest things you can and I can do to bring glory to God, to bless God, to please God, is when we can say, God, I believe you. And watch my life. Because my life is going to back it up. Amen? People who believe it will promise you the world and not follow through. Not God. God said it, and I believe it. And that's good enough for me. Amen? Good enough for me if God said it. Oh, my. That helps me to understand more why God was so disappointed when he came to the Jews and they didn't believe him. He came into his own. And his own received him not. 
in Matthew chapter 5. I, I believe it broke his heart when he went back to his own town and, it's, and he couldn't do anything. He couldn't do great miracles there because the Bible says he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Well, basically what they were saying, Jesus, we saw you grow up. Uh, we just, we can't believe you. And what they were saying is, Jesus, everything you're saying is a lie. Kind of hits home, doesn't it? It really gets you thinking. I, that's why it says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. God calls unbelief a heart that doesn't believe him. A, a what kind of heart? An evil heart. And then he says, in departing from the living God. Yeah, listen, if you can't believe the promises of God and believe the greatness of God, he says you kind of are on, are on the brink where well, you could depart from the living God. You could leave him. And by the way, again, I've said it many times. I've been doing this a long time. I've seen Christians depart who were saved. I believe we're saved. But they, they began to doubt God. And boy, once you begin to go the path of doubting God, you, you're 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 close to that departing part. Slippery slope, absolutely. You're on ice, friend. You're going to fall. That's why I am preaching this message. You, listen, I don't know what, what the future holds, but I, I believe there are going to be many challenges to come. I believe that. And, and if you're going to make it, man, and if you, I mean, if you're going to, not only are you just going to make it, but you're going to get stronger in your faith, then you've got to do what I'm telling you tonight. You got to read that Bible. I mean, your Bible should be more important to you than a cup of coffee, than a sandwich, than a breakfast, and eggs and bacon, and, and biscuits and gravy, and sausage on the side, and a couple pieces of pancakes and butter on top, and strawberry and 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 and, and maple syrup on top. Amen. And a big tall cold glass of orange juice. Amen. I'm hungry. <laughs> and some grits. Amen. And a runny eggs on top of those grits. I'm talking about that's the whole meal right there. We're going to sit down and have a time. It's more important than that. No, John R. Rice used to say it this way. No Bible, no breakfast. No Bible, no breakfast. I'm just saying, you better get in your Bible. You better make that thing. You better be, get committed to that thing. Because you are never going to see a strengthened faith. You're not even reading your Bible. God help you. God help you if things really get rough. We all got it too good right now. We got it amazing. But when things start happening, who's going to stand in grace? It'll be the people that have the faith to believe, to believe God. And it makes me understand also about this whole thing of believing God. Why he was so thrilled when people had faith. That were Gentiles. The centurion came to him and, and said, you don't need to come. He said, you're a man of authority. I understand authority. I, I just tell the men to do something and they do it. I, you've got the authority, he said. Just, you don't have to come to my house. Just say it, Lord, it'll happen. He was so amazed. Jesus said, I, he said, he said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. That's why he was so thrilled. That's why when that, that, that woman came and her daughter was vexed with a demon, when she's a Gentile, and, G, and she came to him and said, please, would you help my daughter? She's vexed with a demon. And Jesus said, I've come to the, to the house of Israel. I'm, I'm not quoting it, of course, but I've only come to the house of Israel. And then she said, yea, Lord, but even dogs get crumbs from the table. Amen. Jesus kind of went, whoa. Whoa, this, 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 this girl means business, man. This, this girl got some faith. And, and so Jesus looked at her and he said, Oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it even unto you. Oh, wow. I'm just, he is, when he comes, that's the kind of faith he's looking for. And my question to you tonight, do you have any, that kind of faith? Do you believe him? Or, or by your actions, you may say you believe, but by your actions you say, I don't believe you, Lord. And you make God a liar? That sounds pretty rough, but I, that's Bible. 
You want to give God the glory. You want God to get glory in your life. Just get a strong faith. Strengthen your faith. Why? Because it honors God. And what did he say? For them that honor me, I will honor them. You say, how does it honor God? Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it is impossible to plead for. Listen, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them. That what? Once in a while, diligently seek him. Diligently. That means every day. Every day you seek him. Every day you ask him. Every day you supplicate. And he says, that's the kind of faith I'm looking for. Not hit and miss and one of these days and miss three. Diligently. My question tonight, are you strengthening your faith? Are you strengthening your faith? Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for these wonderful truths. My heart has just been so thrilled, and it's helped me, it helps my faith, just to not only study, but to preach it and to say it over and over again.